Good to go. Great. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the final installment, the final episode of the Bible Geography series. We finish in Jerusalem. Last week, we entered Jerusalem, and uh, we kind of just flew over the hills and valleys, and we saw a lot, but we could really only scratch the surface, as we can really only do this week. And so I have a plan for tonight to hopefully finish through the PowerPoint slides, the pictures, so you can see in detail kind of all the cool stuff, after a very brief then I'd like to leave us with plenty of time to jump into the scriptures, John 18 in particular. So, without further ado, who would like to open us up in a word of prayer before we jump on it? All right, you got it. All right, Jerry, what's the question? Yes. Yes, I will. Cool. All right. So, note to self, leave even more time. Because um, Temple Mount is one of the things where we could spend just days and days and days on. So, which um, leads me to, if y'all think that it would be a good idea some Saturday or something this summer to do like a geography seminar to really kind of be in Jerusalem more for all the stuff that we haven't really been able to cover in Jerusalem, but anywhere else too. You know, we can take a Saturday and get donuts and coffee and take breaks and have lunch and just kind of take all day if you want. I, I, I'm game. It is our last night. Yeah. I, oh, yeah, well, I guess I've, I'm pleased by that reaction. <laughs> I'd be worried about the other reactions. Great, the final night. Okay, well, let's jump on in. Um, so last week we looked a bit more at the map. I know that we're not going to be as much in the you know the Google Earth this this week, so that's okay. Um, but remember the hills and valleys of Jerusalem. Last week we kind of talked about the hills over here, up here Mount Scopus. Um, here the very famous Mount of Olives. Um, here this kind of whitewashed area. These are all tombs. Whitewashed tombs, actually, literally. Um, this is a big, huge cemetery. A lot of Jews like to be buried here because Zechariah 14 says that the Messiah will come and touch down on the Mount of Olives. So they want to be the first to meet the Messiah when he comes. So that's why this is a big, huge cemetery here. And this is the Mount of Olives. And then Hill of Offense was down here. Remember Solomon built a bunch of uh, high places to his wives. Across the valley, remember what hill we have here? We have the Hill of Evil Council because the United Nations has an installation. Uh, that's not why it's called that. Um, this is where Judas went to conspire against Jesus to try to trap him. So he met with the Typhus and some priests and stuff to conspire. Here, the Hill of Offense, um, no, they probably have some Arabic names. But kind of biblical studies people will call this the Hill of Evil Council. Um, it's a good question. Here we have the Valley of Gehenna. The Hinnom Valley runs west and south of town. Kidron Valley over here. Um, if we come across these places again tonight, like I said, this is a flyover. So we, uh, we have a lot more to talk about if you guys want to do that Saturday seminar or something where we can spend more time and dive more deeply, let me know, because I'd, I'd be happy to do it if you want. I'm going to turn off 3D buildings here just to get the satellite in. Okay, I think jumping back into the PowerPoint to kind of finish those slides as best we can, I think would be good. I will begin again, just very real, briefly looking at Psalm 87. We don't even need to read the whole thing this time. Um, but the way God views Jerusalem as he registers the people throughout all time. Those who are redeemed, those who are his children, 
Psalm 87 talks about how in God's view, you were born in Jerusalem. This one and that one were born there. So remember our challenge was last week. We think of our heavenly citizenship, which is Christ to do so. But have you ever, as a believer, thought of your earthly citizenship? Ultimately, it ain't America. It's Jerusalem. Um, I love the city so much because it is where God has chosen to place his name. So Psalm 87, Jerusalem. All right. Akel Dama was mentioned, um, well, it's, okay, Judas betrays Jesus, member of the Abel Council, and he feels to some degree remorseful afterwards, and he throws the money in the temple, and the priests are like, well, we can't, this is blood money, we can't use it for an offering, so now they're all of a sudden concerned with what's going on. And so let's buy a field for so poor people can be buried. This is Akel Dama, the poor man for me. Um, and this is part on the southern rim of the Valley of Gehenna, which is kind of a nice park area now. <laughs> you know, you walk through hell uh, in a nice park. So, okay. um, I'm going to go pretty fast through the side slides to get to where I really want to get through the side slides. Hinnom Valley on the west, curving to the south part of the city. The Hinnom and the Kidron meet into this wadi to flow down to the Jordan River, which is down here. From Mount Scopus, you can look down and see Jericho. You can see the Dead Sea. You can see a lot of the country from your vantage point. Kidron Valley on the east side. Gethsemane is over here. Mount of Olives up here. Kidron Valley between them and the Temple Mount. You know, when Jesus, after the Last Supper, he's um, giving the high priestly prayer, all of a discourse. He's walking with his disciples. It's a fun walk. You come to Jerusalem with me. We'll do it. From the upper room that I showed you last week down, kind of the, the route that Jesus took with his disciples across the Kidron Valley up to the cliff. And then back he was taken, and then remember I showed you the steps at St. Peter of Galicantu where Jesus was taken up there to Caiaphas' house and kind of held prisoner for the rest of the trial. Kidron Valley, we have uh, just some ancient tombs. This is the tomb of Absalom, not that Absalom. Uh, Hezekiah's Tunnel, this is really cool. You can walk through Hezekiah's Tunnel. And Hezekiah's day, remember when he had to expand the city westward to accommodate all the refugees coming from the Assyrian conquest? Well, he needs to beef up the city. And so the Gihon Spring, their water source, he has to wall off and cap off and protect. And then so they dig this long tunnel from the Gihon Spring under the city to the Pool of Siloam. And so they have in their city walls a reservoir, wa fresh water access to withstand the this is a huge project. There are different theories of how they were even how they even did this. Because you had one team start at the Gihon Spring, one team start at the Pool of Sloan, and they met in the middle. So the prevailing theory that I think is best is you had people above the ground somehow pounding or stomping as a guide to the people below, and they just came in and stayed in the middle. So it's just amazing how you know the engineering marvels that the ancient times. You know, people had to figure things out. They didn't have smartphones. They didn't kind of see why they were smarter. And they just, you know, they did what needed to be done. Uh, this is just artist sketch of capping off the Gihon Spring. Hezekiah's Tunnel, this is walking through Hezekiah's Tunnel. There's always some water in it. In the summertime, the water level is lower. In the wintertime, it's higher. Because uh, those are the, the, the wet seasons. And if you didn't have light sources with you, get your glasses. But you can walk through Hezekiah's Tunnel. To where, roughly in the middle, closer to the Siloam side, they put the Hezekiah's tunnelers, made an inscription, and wrote about how they met each other and put it in Hezekiah's tunnel. This is a replica. Because in the 1800s, it was removed and then it broke into some pieces. It's now in the Istanbul Museum of Archaeology, and Turkey repeatedly refuses to give it back to Israel. Uh, but the original is Istanbul. The replica in ancient Hebrew is written there in Hezekiah's tunnel. This is coming out into, this is not the Pool of Siloam. For the longest time, they thought it was. This is actually Byzantine era. The Pool of Siloam is up these steps to the left down just a little bit. Here's the Pool of Siloam. Here's what has been uncovered. It stretches further to the left here in the picture. And when you're there, kind of looking down on it, it's pretty easy to tell like where the outline is. But... They're starting to uncover more of it. But this is John 9, where Jesus sent the blind man. He came down here, washed himself, and went back to Jerusalem. 
this is the rule of Sabon, or at least the outer step. I think it was probably used as a giant mikvah where you would you're going up to the temple and this is the map here. Down here, the rule of Siloam is at the bottom of the hill of Othniel. Remember in the Old Testament times it was just here. Hezekiah expanded westward. Solomon before him expanded northward to the temple. But Pool of Siloam is down here at the bottom. It has a uh, spri uh, Gihon Springs over here. Hezekiah's tunnel goes underneath. You know, the Pool of Siloam. Boom. Place. Bloop. Here's the route of the Hezekiah's tunnel. Comes to Pool of Siloam. And then Jesus in the triumphal entry. Today is Palm Sunday. The triumphal entry. He's coming from Bethany. Where Lazarus is from and was raised from the grave. He comes just, you know, a mile over down to Mount of Olives to get drone. Comes up from the southern gate, past the Pool of Siloam, and he takes his colt up to the temple. People waving palm branches and laying their coats and cloaks before him. And you can take this route today. The same road, the same Roman road that he rode on, you can walk on. Um, in fact, I have a rock from that path that he took. This was from the Roman road. That, uh, you know, his donkey was right on the stuff. Got it. Bidding starts at $6,000. Okay. Um, but, so pilgrims, I think, would use the Pool of Siloam as a mikvah to kind of ritualistically cleanse themselves, purify themselves as they go up to worship at Jesus. Jesus entered up through the temple here. And, you know, if you read the Gospels carefully, for several days, he and his disciples kind of take over the temple. Now. They take over. And he's teaching doing wonderful things, and being confronted by Pharisees, and he's outsmarting them and mic-dropping them at every turn. And um, every day, he, you know, he's staying overnight in Bethany, and it's, every day it's like he's going to work, to the temple, back and forth, back and forth, between Palm Sunday and when, you know, the night before the Passover, where he has the last supper with his disciples. And so his disciples, of course, are thinking, hey, we're in the kingdom now, man. We're, we, we got it going. We're, you know, Jesus is king. This, it's all happening because we've taken over which adds to their utter confusion when he gets crucified. Um, so, back to the PowerPoint. Rule of Siloam. And this is the road. It's under the modern street level. They've uncovered beneath. And this is Roman road. Up, 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 up. From the bottom of the hill of Ophel up to the temple. Okay, this is a model of the Ophel. Old Testament city of David, that one hill. And as you enter the city of David, I just love this golden heart. Um, these are some of the excavations near Ophel. This would be the Old Testament Jerusalem, before all the expansion. And this part of kind of the complex there, this left one is most likely the Tomb of David. Great case to be made here in Joel Kramer's book, and he also has a video on it. Um, that this was, this is, the kings were buried in Jerusalem. Everybody else buried outside the city. The kings actually were buried in Jerusalem. The only tombs in Jerusalem are here. And they're ornate. Now the ceiling has collapsed over the years and all that sort of stuff. Um, but most likely this one here was David's. I have a piece of pottery from it. This pottery shard most likely is not biblical. This is probably Byzantine era. It has some painting on it, but biblical nonetheless. And I took that from David's tomb. And David's palace, what is left of it, at least the foundation of part of it. Um, Iliad Mazar discovered this in the 2000s, and um, she, Jew, not a Christian, but she used the Bible as source material, as historical record. Oh, the Bible says this, it matches up here. She kept using the Bible as the authoritative source, which, she, which is why she was just roundly rejected by the archaeological community. Because you can use any source you want, except you better not use the Bible, because they've already rejected it. So they think that if it lines up with the Bible, it can't be true. But she, you know, eh, this is it. So you can walk through what's left of David's palace today. Um, looking down from David's palace, there are houses built onto, you know, the base of the hill, the fortified hill. And your most trusted people would live closer to the palace. One of his most trusted people was Uriah. And so from the top of David's palace, I, you know, every time I look down, I imagine that one of these houses is Bathsheba. I can't say no. But it gives you kind of a, a good sense of, like, what it was like. Right? These mages and 
uh, I love walking through that course. That's just really fascinating to pick that apart. Um, and of course, David's wonderful Psalm of Repentance, Psalm 51, on that. Um, continuing down, you know, this uh, this steep structure is very ancient, from the Iron Age, kind of from David's time, the time of the king. Um, yeah, I think I have the, yeah, Nehemiah, the tower here, this is from Nehemiah's day, the reconstruction of the city after the, uh, the regathering from Persia, Cyrus edict for them to return, Nehemiah comes, sword in one hand, prowl in the other, and they're rebuilding. This tower is left over from Nehemiah. The dung gate, beautifully named. You know, you'd have to remove the dung and the offal from the sacrifices to bring in salvage the dung. Um, retain the name, but here it is. Hey, if you're wandering around Jerusalem, you will see kind of bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, celebrations, and they're coming, and they're singing, and they're dancing. You know, the honored 13-year-old is under the tent. and They love people to just join on in. And if you're an American tourist, they don't care. They love you to just join on in. You don't know what they're singing. You don't know the words. But you just, you're clapping, you're celebrating with them, and they love you. So you just kind of see that all over. First Temple Grounds this is on the southern portion of the temple. This is uh, First Temple. This is Solomonic. Okay, so his storehouses. Um, Priestly precincts, you know, where they kept stuff. A lot of uncovering has been done here. Mikvah, here. Storeroom. Okay, second temple, Herodian structure. These stones are dead giveaway for Herodian people. Look at these beveled edges. Herod loved these things. And remember we talked about Masada? Um, and the Jews were able to hold out for a while. Um, except, remember who was attacking them? Which empire was uh, took over Masada after the Jewish rebellion? Rome. And who is not to be stopped ever in the history of the world? Rome is never to be stopped. There is one historical example of where Rome gave up, and that is trying to dismantle Rome. This construction is so flawless, um, it's so marvelous, even they gave up trying to dismantle the Temple Mount. They dismantled the temples and all the buildings and push them off this lead down to the street below, and you can see that, I think I have a picture, where the, the stone street is all dented and stuff because of Titus and the soldiers pushing everything off, collapsing down to the market streets below. Uh, but this is looking up at what is called the pinnacle of the temple. Okay, up here was a stone of the trumpeter, where the trumpeter would go and blow the shofar to announce the sacrifice of worship. And I'm looking up from the ground level up to and this is my friend, you know, this is how big this is. You go up the Temple Mount, you start encountering stones that are as big as city buses. One stone. And like how did they construct that? It's just genius work. It's amazing construction. Here's the street below. Look at all the dented pockmarked streets. Because this is the rubble from the buildings of the temple. Remember when Jesus told his disciples, not one stone will be left upon another absolutely right. The buildings on top of the Temple Mount were all pushed off, and here are the stones that Jesus is pointing to and referring to. They're right here. And these were, you know, shops and stalls in the marketplace and stuff. This was a super busy street. So, uh, side note, devil taking Jesus up to the pinnacle of the Temple. There's a bit of a debate of where exactly that happened. Um, okay. Jump in. I know I'm boozy. I didn't even want to spend too much time on this story. Some people think it's uh, on the east side because it's a far drop down to the Kidron Valley. Some people think it's on top of what was the temple building itself. Um, the picture I took is right down here this corner. And it was the place of the trumpeter. It makes more sense with the temptation itself of why it would have been up here, the pinnacle of the temple. Because it was a super busy street below, and if Jesus jumps off the temple, what would happen? Everyone would see. The angels would lift him up. So everyone would. I think when people are going by, the devil and Jesus were there. They're seeing two people. They're seeing two figures. Everyone's like, oh, okay, this is the temple. And it's the devil tempting Jesus to jump down because the angels won't even let. They're going to lift you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. The point of the temptation was everybody would have seen that. Oh my, that's okay. Clearly, we need to submit to that person. That would have been real tempting. Each of those temptations, 
yes, Jesus is God. Yes, he never sinned. Yes, he was very really tempted. Okay, we can't just brush that off as Jesus being like, get out of here, Satan. They were real temptations. They were surrounding the kingdom. They were what Jesus really, truly deserved to have. But Jesus wasn't going to get them the devil. Anyway, I think it was right up here in this corner. That's what Jesus was saying. The stone where the trumpeter would trumpet from was found below. This is a replica, original Israeli museum. Um, and this says, to the place of the trumpeter. This was above that corner, and Titus and the Romans had put it there. Triple gate, um, in Jesus' day it would have been two, and this is where you go up into the temple. I have a very small little rock from this collection. Um, but this is where they come up, and Jesus entered through these gates and goes to the temple. Up and down, up and down, back and forth, back and forth. Um, this is an example of, you can see, different periods of construction. This wall jutting out here clearly was built at some point where this Western wall, here's the Wailing Wall. Many Jews will come here to worship. You come down, um, you have to have your head covered. Baseball hat works fine, uh, but they have a little thing of free yarmulke. You can just walk it on down, just pick one up, put it on your head, and they're fine with you going to the wall. They put their prayers into the crevices and stuff. Here's the women's side. Here's the men's side. And underneath this arch, this was uh, Herod's aqueduct. This is the remainder base of it, aqueduct that brought water from Solomon's pool, from the Judean hills, to the temple. Underneath the aqueduct here is an opening into the synagogue. I probably need to make this. Here's the Wailing Wall, or Western Wall. And here's that synagogue down underneath the arch. These archways here are the underside of the Roman aqueduct. In fact, this whole wall would have been more exposed in Rome's day along the temple. This is the West Wall Tunnel. Here's the uh, stone that's as big as a city bus. And this is, I mean, different eras throughout history. There's the Byzantine era here, this Crusader era. Okay, Temple Mount. Is that in there? That ain't happening. Um, this is flyover. Again, Saturday seminar. If you want one, we'll get much more detail. Temple Mount, 26 football field. There it is. It is massive. Down here are the Solomonic areas that I told you about, first temple, you know, area. Down here is the uh, street marketplace where Titus and the Romans pushed all the, they would have pushed all the buildings off everywhere. But down here is where they've uncovered, you can actually go to the roof and see the destroyed street below. The Valley of Kidron is over here. Some people think the temptation was over here because it's the longest way down, but there's nobody over here. It makes more sense, I think, to stay here. Dome of the Walk Rock is there in that corner. Yes, so the Temple Mount, the first temple in size, probably would have been something like this. Second temple, they rebuild it, not as glorious of a structure. Herod comes along, Herod the Great comes along and expands it greatly. North, that direction, build it up. Built the Antonia Fortress in the northwest corner for the Roman Catholic garrison, and he really, really built it up. It was something in Jesus' day. Now, I'm sure the first temple was something. Um, second temple, cool, not as something. Until Herod comes along and really builds it up. And even the Romans were super impressed when Titus gets there and says, Hey, you brought all this stuff in. We can use it. And he's like, Yeah, you're the Roman. Um, it's amazing. So this is looking north. East is off to the east. The eastern gate aligns with the Dome of the Spirits back here. I tend to think that the Holy of Holies was right here. Temple structure was here. Um, it also it doesn't matter. The prevail the, the common theory is that Dome of the Rock is right over where the temple was. Right. There's there's good reasons either way. It's it's a, it's a tough debate.
they do, they'd love to have it right here. Um, depending on your eschatological views, uh, part of the genius of the Antichrist might be allowing the Jews to rebuild their temple over where it actually used to be, and then you don't have to destroy the Dome of the Rock, you can build a better one. That's one theory. Um, Al-Aqsa Mosque, you might have heard of it in the news, it is right here. Artist rendition of what the Temple Mount was uh, in Jesus' day. Fortress Antonia up here, where that Roman garrison is. Court of the Gentiles, Court of the Women. Solomon's Portico, Solomon's Cave, which is not actually the Temple Mount. Okay, uh, walking around the Temple Mount, again, we can save this for, you know, a big seminar or something if you want to look. This is looking inside. You can't go in here unless you're a Muslim. I don't recommend converting to Islam while we're there to get in here. Um, ah, not even close. Which is good. Um, but this is the bedrock. So this is, um, yeah, where Abraham offered Isaac on Mount Moriah in the bedrock. That's why they built the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Spirits, where I think probably the temple was in the Holy of Holies was here. This also is a, a spot of that. Um, okay, Eastern Gate. Josephus said you can look straight through the Eastern Gate straight into the Holy of Holies from the Mount of Olives. The actual biblical gate is below this level, like the Feast of the Mount of Olives. And so Muslims will build, have built um, tombs here because in their mind, then the Messiah can't come because he will never walk through a cemetery and make himself unclean. That's their, that's how they see it. So that's why they put, yeah, uh, it's not going to work, but it's a good idea. Um, Garden of Gethsemane, these are old. As much as we'd like to think these very trees were there in Jesus' day, when Titus and the Romans came in the year 70 to seize Jerusalem, they chopped down every bit of wood they could possibly find for the siege engines and to burn the trees. But these trees would have sprouted up right after that. These are thousands of years old. I think these trees aren't quite back to Jesus' day, but almost. But you can walk around in the Garden of Gethsemane and see them. You can see all trees probably right there in the area where Jesus was with his disciples when he was betrayed. There's a cave close by. And um, there's a place where Jesus often met with his disciples. And this cave traditionally is that, is that spot. You can go down. And the uh, very hard-nosed, rough priest down there will have none of it. But you can go here and sit and pray silently for a while. And on your way out, he will hand you an olive. An olive. Mount of Olives. There's a lot to talk about in the Mount of Olives. A lot, a lot, a lot. We'll have to save it before the end of the year. Um, looking out from the Mount of Olives over the Kidron Valley back on the Temple Mount. You can do your camel rides here. Um, looking at from the Mount of Olives Overlook to the Temple Mount. Okay. Yes. Did you have a question? Oh. Okay, turn to John 18. We are going to look at Google Earth. West side of the city. Um, we will zoom in on the west side. Valley of Gethsemane. Uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Roy Beecham from Jesus Central Seminary, he spent a few months and lived lived in Jerusalem and studied at the Institute of Holy Land Studies, which is right over here. And he stayed somewhere over here, and every day he walked through the Valley of Gehenna up there. So he built a course. If I had to walk through hell any day, you guys got nothing. Gehenna, hell, you know, it's a location. So anyway. Um, nice kind of park area now, and you come up the west side of the city, not the western wall, which is the Wailing Wall, but the west wall of the city. Okay, so, turn on the 3B, 3D buildings. Remember we talked about Herod's Palace last week, the Tower of David, which again has nothing to do with David? But this is a great place to, uh, this is a great museum to go to. Herod's Palace is a, extended beyond this, all the way over here. This kind of big rectangular area, this modern street, get to the Armenian quarter. Herod's palace precinct is all this. Herod 
wanted his own entrance into the city. Okay, he was trying to come into the city one time, and there was a festival going on, and the priests would not allow it. You can't come in, we're having a festival, you know, this is all on you, and all that. They're like, big you know who wants it. Um, and so there was kind of this big debate, big fight, so Herod's like, that ain't ever happening again, I am carving a personal entrance to the city. I don't care. So he made an entrance to his palace <coughs> from outside the city. And a Roman garrison would be stationed here as well. And during the time like the Passover, um, where everybody from the country and from other parts of the world are swelling the city, there's not even enough room in the city for everybody to stay. So pilgrims would have come and camped out wherever they could, including on the hillside of the Valley of Gehenna, which that's fine. So Herod carves his own entrance to his palace. During the Passover, safest place in the city not Fortress Antonia, it is Herod's palace. Where does Pontius Pilate come and stay during the Passover? With the Roman garrison in Herod's palace. Pontius Pilate is staying as the governor, prefect of Judea. He stays here during the Passover. Okay. John 18. That's the new seat. This satellite image is the remainder of the ancient staircase that led into Herod's palace. Remember when we were at Dan? What did we see at Dan in the gate, in the city gate complex? Hmm? Yes, a Bama seat. All the city gates had them. Uh, pomegranate carvings at the corners. And you would put a seat on top of the platforms for the town official, town elder to pass judgment. Up along the bedrock, along Herod's palace wall, led up to a Bema seat. So this is the remainder of the ancient staircase that led up to a wall. No, in Herod's day, it was an entrance into the palace, heavily guarded. Up along the um, side, this bedrock, Yabatha means bedrock. There's a strip of bedrock here. Um, this right here, right here, and you can see there's this kind of tiered walkway up there. It would leave at night. The tiered walkway would lead up here, overlooking the Valley of Gehenna to this. One tier of carved platform, two tier of carved platform. The rounded pomegranate carvings are no longer there. They were there my first trip, my second trip. You put a seat up here, or on in, covering you. Okay, John 18. Verse 28. Uh, we pick up the story in media red, after Jesus' sham trial before the Sanhedrin. <coughs> then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled. Okay, Roman standards and stuff in the governor's palace, Herod's palace, they would be unclean if you went in there. Um, so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. We don't want to jerk them. So Pilate went outside to them. Now, this is a night. Pilate goes outside. To them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered them over to you. Pilate, we wouldn't waste time. Come on, we love Jesus. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Show us what's on their heart. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. One that would be at the rejection of his own. So Pilate entered his headquarters again, back through here. There was an opening in here, there, back through here. He goes back to his headquarters again and called Jesus. Okay, you're going to come in with me, away from the crowd. Go. And said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? He has to do his due diligence. Pilate's in a tough spot. Okay, Tiberius is Caesar. Pilate's good buddy Sejanus has already finally been killed after Tiberius was on to him, like, buddy, you're trying to take over my spot, and that ain't happening. Sejanus 
Pilate and friend and he's killed. Pilate is left in a precarious spot. Remember under the Roman Empire, if you work for Rome, what, is, what are your two responsibilities? Keep the tax money flowing to Rome and keep the peace. What is the hardest area in the Roman Empire to keep peace? This, right here. There have been times where Pilate has had to use a heavy hand or he put too far. And earlier on in his career, there's no doubt about it, he's like, he's not nice. Time goes by. And he's about to come to this day. He's going to be thrust into the biggest mess ever. The Jews are coming to him and saying, hey, we have somebody for you that needs to be put to death. And so Pilate says, yeah, keep trying yourself. Are you the king of the Jews? He has to ask him. Because in Rome, there ain't no king but Caesar. And so he has to be, if Jesus, remember we've talked about the Messianic secret. If Jesus goes out day one and says, hey, I'm the Messiah, what happens? Caesar has to be killed. Jesus has to really walk a fine line everywhere he goes and everything he says. He's keeping many plates spinning in the air. Genius at how he does it. Now's the time, however. Are you the king of the Jews? So Jesus answered and said, do you say this of your own accord? Like, did, did you think of this yourself? Or did others say it to you about me? Or are they putting you up to this? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? <clears throat> Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world, the ESV says. There's a better way to translate that preposition, which it does soon. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not, better way to translate this, from this world. My kingdom is not sourced in this world. My kingdom does not come about the same way y'all's kingdom does. The same way every other kingdom comes about in the history of the world. By force, by violence, by fiat, by whatever. That's not how my kingdom starts. Not like all the rest of you. My kingdom is not from this world. If it was, hey, my servants would be fighting, we'd have a war on our hands. That's not what's happening. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Because Jesus mentioned the kingdom. <clears throat> Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. Uh, for this purpose, I was born. And for this purpose, I have come into the world. To bear witness to the truth, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate's response is fascinating. I hate talking on the phone. I hate it. I don't know why. Phone conversations on the phone, I despise. <laughs> hate it. I am a texter. All right? You can, I love texting. Okay? You can send me a message. I can read it. And I'd be like, I'll respond at the perfect time. Then I respond at the perfect time. You can read it. Think about it. Respond at the perfect time. It's wonderful. It's wonderful, isn't it? Great. Uh, what's the huge drawback to texting? Yeah, you only have the words. Now, maybe emo emojis and things like that. But you only have the words. You don't have tone of voice, facial expression. A lot of miscommunication can happen over text, I readily admit. Okay? We don't have tone of voice from Pilate, we don't have facial expression. There is one way that Pilate gets thought about and understood far more than others. I will play my hand right away and tell you that I think that somebody has undergone a lot more character assassination throughout, the, throughout history than nearly is warranted. That's Pontius Pilate. Okay. Everybody just assumes he's a bad guy, and then they read all of his words as if he's a bad guy. Now, he could have said, now it could be where he's like, <laughs> what is true? Or it could be but what is true? Okay, we don't know. We're going to have to judge Pilate by his actions. After he said this, <clears throat> he went back outside, back outside, maybe even all the way up to his famous seat, sit down, and to the Jews and, and tell them, I find no guilt in him. Okay, he is not what you've made him out to be, some insurrection. Some threat to Caesar. I find no guilt of that. 
but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover, so do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. Okay, the Greek word is lasting, not just any robber. The Jews are claiming Jesus is an insurrectionist, some upstart king, a threat to Caesar. That's their best shot to get Jesus killed by Pilate. Because that's what they're making up. Now, Barabbas was a high insurrectionist. Hey, you need to put this insurrectionist to death. Well, I don't find any guilt in him. Do you want me to release him, him to you or Bar Barabbas? Oh, Barabbas. Okay. That it, nonsense is prevailing. Okay, people get so heated in their, their desperate attempt to get somebody that all logic and reason goes out the window. There's nothing new under the sun. Human nature has always been the same. We think that our society is so bad. Yeah, it is. It ain't nothing different than what society has always been. Okay, now Barabbas was a robber. Okay, so <clears throat> if I claim that Pilate has undergone character assassination and we should judge him by his actions, verse 1 and 2, you might be saying, Ah, Adam, I got you. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Not nice action. Of course not. Why did Pilate do this? Okay, Pilate goes out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Behold the man. Jesus is up here in his famous seat, or Pilate is, Jesus is standing right next to him. Behold the man, Eka Homo. Why did Pilate have Jesus flogged and presented to them this way? To show to them that he finds no fault in him. Behold the man is the key phrase. Behold, this is the guy you're trying to tell me is a threat to see. This is the guy, look at how battered and bruised he is and bloody he is. You're trying to convince me that he's going to overthrow Caesar? Look, he's not guilty, and I'm trying to show you that he's not what you're trying to make him out to be. I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Don't ever, ever, ever by the garbage line that Jesus had been laying out there. He did so several times in the clearest way that he possibly could. It is why they're trying to kill him. He's made himself out to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. Remember what his wife told him in the book of Matthew. What did Pilate's wife tell him? What kind of man? Had nothing to do with this righteous man. When Pilate heard him say he's made himself to be the son of God, he was even more afraid. Who do you think Pilate was more afraid of in this situation? I think it's Jesus. He entered his headquarters again, back through here, and said to Jesus, Where are you? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, remember I'm a texter and we lose tone of voice. Pilate could have said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Okay, yes, he could have said it that way. Also, I think the text below gives us another answer. You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and to crucify you? Jesus, work with me. Why aren't you saying anything? 
you're not guilty. I can get you out of here. Remember what I said about temptation. What did Jesus pray to God the night before in the Garden of Gethsemane? There's a way. Now, not my will, but yours. Fully sold out to what God's will is. Pilate comes the next day, gives him that. You guys, I get so jazzed about this story because of that. Because Jesus had his out. Who's the one that makes the cross happen? Not Pilate, not the Jews, it's not the devil, it's Jesus. Nobody is more determined to go to the cross than Jesus himself. He had his out. Work with me, Jesus. Don't you realize I have the authority to release you and, and to crucify you? Jesus answered him, and now this is just me kind of picturing the visuals, but maybe Jesus puts his hands on Pilate's shoulders. Jesus is going to have to basically tell Pilate, Pilate, it's okay. It's not your fault. Matthew records Pilate later going out, washing his hands, saying, I have nothing to do with this man's blood. And that was right for Pilate. That's not him being sneaky, like, eh, I'm trying to weasel out of it. That's him telling the crowd, I am innocent of this man's blood. Remember what the Gospel of Matthew records the crowd saying upon that? His blood be on us and our children. We accept full responsibility for this. We're proud of it. It's funny the complaint they have is the demon is like, hey, you're trying to make us guilty of this man's blood. Yes, you said you were. Okay, Jesus answered him, since we don't have tone of voice. Oftentimes, you watch the Hollywood rendition of this or whatever, and it's going to be, you would have no authority over me at all, unless it's been granted to you from above. The flow of the narrative, I don't know. I'm getting the sense that Jesus is like, Pilate, you wouldn't be in this mess. You would have no authority over me at all, unless it had been granted to you from above. The Greek word is anothen. So it's not from heaven. Jesus is just saying, from above. And from anothen means that an above place, a higher place, higher authority. Now ultimately, it's absolutely true. Pilate would have no authority unless God had given it to him. But I think Jesus might even be meaning, Pilate, you wouldn't have any authority over me unless it had been granted to you from somebody over here. Probably like Caesar. Like you're here because this is your appointment. You're stuck in this moment of history. It's not you that's in you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't be in this place unless you too were responsible to somebody and you were put here. Caesar told you to be here. My father told me to be here. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Most specifically, Caiaphas and his group of Pharisees. But those who have turned me over to you, they're the ones with the greater sin. Okay. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out. They know the story. They know how to get at Pilate. Ah, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Okay, they already knew he was on shaky ground because his buddy Sejanus, the higher up, is dead. And he has a, he's in a shaky appointment. Um, it's been hard to keep the peace in Jerusalem at all. And Caesar's friend was an official designation as somebody in the good graces of Caesar. And they're saying, if you let this man go, we're telling you he's an insurrection. There's no king but Caesar. If you let him go, you're not Caesar's friend, Pilate. What are you going to do? They're trying to put trap Pilate now. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes me. So when Pilate heard these words, He brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement with an Aramaic Sabbath road. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. Before it was like a homo, behold the man. Now it's like a rex vestment. Behold your king. 
cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered this. You read the words yourself. Obviously, I'm not God. Understatement of all of the day. I can't make this judgment call. But when I read the entirety of Scripture, I can't help but to think there was no greater betrayal of God himself than this right here. We have no king but Caesar? Who was supposed to be Israel's king? God himself. We have no king but Caesar? Excuse me. They didn't like Caesar. They hated Caesar. And their abject hatred for the one sent by God to be their king. They say, we have no king but Caesar. To me, that's the biggest betrayal they had ever committed against him. Pilate can really do nothing else, I think, encouraged by Jesus, to make it happen. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out, carrying his own cross, He went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull. The Aramaic is called Golgotha. This morning, I read about how Simon the Cyrene coming in from the countryside, which I think is another point of evidence that this is the spot where it's happening. He's coming in from the countryside. He's coming from Libya, and as you go up to Jerusalem, you're coming up probably on the Watershed Bridge, and you're coming along the western part of the city. You are coming in from the countryside. And as they leave Herod's palace, they're going to go up to a place called the Skull. He's coming in from the countryside. Right when they're leaving, they're like, hey, you, come on. You're, you're going to pick up the cross with us. They've already flogged him. I think it was Pilate said to him to release him. He did, however, his due diligence as prefect of Judea to do what he felt needed to be done, which was part of that. And they take him here. The, uh, the Via Dolorosa. Way of the cross, way of passion. If you go to Israel as, as a priest, they're going to say it starts at the place of the trial. They're going to say it's Fortress Antonia. That's the longest tradition. It's not tradition because the evidence points to it. It's tradition. The evidence points to it. The Via Dolorosa is this place where there's you know, 14 stages of the cross, where you travel a route from Jerusalem from here. It ends at the right place. But you go along, and at every place of the cross, Jesus fell here, and all the people cried here, and his tears fell here, and he healed somebody here. That you, you buy souvenirs. You go to those places and buy souvenirs. Not as many souvenirs to purchase something from Jesus, although they did. Um, so anyway, they lead him here, and remember, we looked at the city walls last week. In Jesus' day, this was outside the city. In Jesus' day, the city walls came north of Joppa Gate, straight over, kind of along the aqueduct, off of this was outside the city. They took Jesus, and he went bearing his own cross to the place of the skull, Aramaic called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. I have the three buildings here. You can see the same the satellite image. Under this app was the place of the cross. Um, this is where Hadrian came, and he filled in the place with dirt, and he puts up a statue of Venus over the place where Jesus was crucified. Statue of Jupiter over the place where Jesus was crucified. Uh, there's two different structures Hadrian built. This is the west side of one church, the temple. This is the east side of another church. Now it's all under one roof. The cross, most likely, here is its app. <clears throat> hill of Golgotha. Yeah, it was a garden area. It would have been a hill. I mean, you go there today, you can't make out hill. Um, but as far back in history as you can go, this church marks the spot where Hadrian marked the spot over the other spot where the Jews knew where it happened. And all that kind of stuff. It's, it's the best overwhelming amount of evidence. You can read about it uh, a lot in excavating the evidence for Jesus and where God came from. It's one of Jesus' books. Oh, by the way, how could I be remiss to mention 
uh, pile of famous heat. Um, these stones kind of in the crevices here. No bid on that. Okay. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus was crucified. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Now, remember I talked about what would be put above criminals' heads on the crosses, their crime. So Pilate has to write what Jesus' crime was and why he's up there on the cross. And what does he write? He writes the truth. He writes who Jesus is. Jesus' crime was being who he is. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Jesus Nazarenus Rex Iodor, INRI. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic and Latin and Greek, so no one could read it. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. He's not the king of the Jews, so can't, that can't be his crime. His crime was he claimed to be. I love Pilate's response. Now, for whatever it's worth, Pilate is sainted in the Coptic and Ethiopian religion. I think it's quite possible they got that right. Now, I don't buy into the saints and what all those things, but what they're recognizing, I think it's quite possible. You and I stand before God in glory, and we are taken up to the heavenly realms. And amen and amen. I wouldn't be shocked if we meet Pontius Pilate there. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Now, yes, if you read about Pilate's earlier career, he does a lot of bad things. He's a Roman's Roman. Leading up to this place, however, and what his wife said, and what happens at the trial, and then you read what history there is of his life afterwards in the early church tradition, it's quite possible Pilate, this is Pilate's journey into truth. This might very well be Pilate's first public declaration of what he believes. I don't know. For all I know, Pilate was the biggest jerk in human history, okay? We don't have tone of voice. But I think there's a lot that works together to show something contrary to what our assumptions often are. And if we look at the other gospel accounts and every other mention of Pilate in the scriptures, and we have more time if you care, I can walk you through about how those also are not indictments. They're just simple matters of fact. Even the whole thing where he sends them to Herod, Herod comes back, they have to use the lab. There's other stuff going on there. Uh, by the way, when he, Pilate sends Jesus to Herod, and uh, Luke, uh, it's just down the hall. It's not like across the city or anything. Send him down the hall to Herod, Herod sends him back. Okay, but again, what the really cool thing about that whole narrative is not about Pilate. Eh, it's not about Pilate. It's not about Pilate cool thing about that narrative is even though Pilate was giving Jesus an out, I think that might have been the final real temptation of Jesus. You talk about a final last temptation of Christ. There it probably is. I can get you out of this mess. Jesus is the one that made it happen. Pastor, when you're going through uh, John 13, Last Supper, I like what you what he brought out about that is Jesus almost kind of protected him, right? Because if Judas was found out by the others, the others were like, let's tie him down and feed him up. He's not going to betray Jesus. Jesus had to shield Judas from that. Why? To make it happen, not just to be nice to Judas, to make it happen. If anybody made the cross happen, it is Jesus himself. You uh, let's have a seminar so we can dig deeper into Jerusalem because there's a lot more to talk about. Any final questions or thoughts? We have half a minute left. Yes, go for it. On the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? Do you want the 3D building or do you want the... Uh, you can go to Google Earth. You can click 3D building. There. You can go 
Google pictures of Tripoli Sepulcher. I remember last week I showed you a lot of pictures. Um, yeah, and when we're there together, we'll be there. Okay, let's pray. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for the time that we've had to look into your word, to look at your land, and just uh, to be marveled by it. Father, most of all, may we be marveled by what the Son has done for us, what you have done through history, and what you continue to do, and even what you are going to do. Thank you so much for your love, for Jesus' determination to execute your will so that we can have eternal life and fellowship with you forever. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everyone.